Are you ready to hear from the Word of God today? Because I'm not going to give it to you unless you tell me you're ready for it. Ooh, I heard like four people, five people ready. Not so good. King of Kings, are you ready to hear from the Word of God? Yes. Now we're ready. Welcome to King of Kings, if this is your first time or if you're a visitor. We want to welcome everyone watching on live, Kings Community Live and Facebook Live. We say Chag Sameach to you. Welcome uh, to our time here in Jerusalem. I, I wish that, or I hope for, the day in the age to come where I can sing for hours and hours before the throne and my voice doesn't go out. I don't have that gift yet. My voice keeps going out. So you're going to bear with me because you know what I was doing down here? Letting it all go. i just so in love with God. So in love with him. and So thankful for what he's done. And our team tonight, you know what? This was their fifth service today. Can you just say thank you to our worship team today? You might have noticed that they were wearing those very nice t-shirts, connected as family. You saw that out in the lobby. That's something we've been promoting as a goal of ours, is to connect deeper into our community groups, into our discipleship classes, getting to know one another, take some time out in the lobby, fellowship, get some coffee, let's become deeper as family. But we're so happy you're here. God's timing. One of the things we're going to talk about tonight is God's timing. So go ahead and turn in your Bible to Numbers chapter 23. And as you do that, the ushers are passing the offering baskets so that we can give God his tithe and our offering. That's part of our worship. Let's do so with joy and generously. We have some wonderful guests. I just want to mention quickly our friends from Sicily are here today from Congregation B'nai Ephraim. You might have noticed one of our friends, Eliana, was on the cello here playing with us just a few minutes ago. And also, Dario and Marta are here on the front row. Welcome to King of Kings, guys. So happy to have you all today. It's a great day in the presence of the Lord. We've entered this holy season, this Passover season, where we believe that the Messiah was sacrificed as our Passover lamb. We accept his blood over the door in ancient times, but over our hearts today. And we believe that this wasn't a coincidence of the timing. The, the timing of the Passover is crucial, that we would connect it with the Messiah, Yeshua. And then, if you know the story, Yeshua was crucified on Passover, and then he went into the grave for parts of three days. And what is the festival that the Lord gave us as Passover kicks off is the next week, of course, we're celebrating unleavened bread. And remember that Yeshua himself connected the idea of unleavened bread with sin itself. And he told us that, that leaven is, is like sin that goes through, and if it goes unchecked, it will, it will leaven the whole loaf. It will become bad for the whole loaf of bread. And so while he was in the grave taking away our sin, we're celebrating the holiday of unleavened bread. Isn't that Amazing, the timing of God. Dying as our Passover lamb on Passover, taking away our sin on unleavened bread. And yet, a few days after the Passover, we have the next commanded festival of God. First fruits was commanded. And that's where we arrive at today. Today is the day of first fruits. It's the resurrection of Yeshua, our Messiah. It's a special holy day and holiday. It's also what we would call around the world Resurrection Sunday. And this year, we got blessed that everything coincided. Everything collided on one day. So I think you, are sh you should be in for some great anointing tonight. Can you believe you're in Jerusalem for this? We didn't want to make those online jealous. Sorry about that. But we get to be in Jerusalem and it's a party here. We're celebrating the Lord our God. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam shehechianu v'kiyamanu v'higianu lazman hazeh. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us and, and brings us and sustains us so that we can reach this special season. We say that blessing each time there's a holiday. Praise his name. And God's timing is impeccable. The Lord had given us a word in our prayer time prior to service. I want to share that with you just for a moment because I want to kind of massage your spirit for where we're going to go tonight. You're going to need to put your seatbelt on for this one, okay? 
That means we're going to move fast. That's what that means. It means it's going to be powerful tonight. But the Lord shared with us in our prayer time that of all the miracles we see in the Bible, of all the, the supernatural things that God does and all the holidays that God gives us, the only one the devil ever tried to cover up was the resurrection of Yeshua. Do you remember the story where the religious leaders paid the Roman guards to make up a story and tell them, don't tell them he rose from the dead. Tell them somebody came and stole his body. This is the holiday. This is the festival day that the enemy is so afraid of. It's the one he tried to cover up. Do you understand? And that's important. He knew the impact of this because without the resurrection of the Messiah, we have only the death of the Messiah. And you know what that makes him? That makes him a martyr. But it's the resurrection that makes him the Messiah. It's the resurrection of the dead that proves his deity in our life. Let's go on this journey together tonight. Let me begin by introducing an idea. You know, there's a debate that rages about the idea of who God is, what does he look like. Isn't it going to be great one day to know what he looks like? I think that'll be a great day. I don't know about you. I don't even know if we will be able to see him, to be honest with you. Revelation seems to say we will see him in the New Jerusalem. There will be no temple because he's there. There will be no sun to give light because he's there. Taking us back to Genesis where, and God said, let there be light on day number one. And there was light and it was good. And yet the sun wasn't created until day number four. That's the same Yeshua we're going to get in the New Jerusalem. Amen. Amen. You know, if the Spirit hits you with truth tonight, would you celebrate that? Would you say amen and hallelujah? Would you, would you get into the Word with me tonight? Because this is not supposed to be a show, you understand. This is not a college lecture where I'm giving you some information. You're supposed to be writing it down for a test we're going to take later. You're supposed to be jumping into the Word with me. Can you do that tonight? Amen. Let's enjoy the Word. Let's enjoy the banquet table of the Lord tonight. The debate is this. What does God look like? Does he have physical form? Is he, is he something you can describe? Can you, could you see him and then draw what you saw? I want to introduce to you tonight a, a very deep theological thought, and it's this, that God has physicality. What does that big word mean? It means God can move in the physical realm. There's an aspect of God that has the capacity to flow in a spirit form, but also in a flesh form, a physical form, if you will. This is important when we talk about the resurrection of the Messiah, because he can impact the physical world. Why, why could he not impact the physical world? Wasn't it he who created the physical world? So how can you create the physical world without impacting it? How can you create the physical world without interacting with it? And so we can never say God has no form. God can take a form if he wants. But a lot of unbelievers through the ages have, have used this next verse to say that Yeshua cannot be the Messiah in Numbers chapter 23 that we're about to read because he was physical. Listen to what it says, verse 19. God is not human that he should lie not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? You see, that verse has been twisted. It's been, it's been used wrongly before. God, in his almighty default form, is, of course, not human. Why? Because humanity was a creation of his. So, of course, he's not human. That doesn't mean he can't take physical form because he has physicality. You can touch him, right? When the little kids ran to Yeshua and he said, let him come to me, and they sat on his lap, you know, they didn't just like fall to the ground. There was actually a lap to sit on. When he was hugging people, they weren't just like floating through him like a ghost. There was actually touch. There was hugging. There was physicality. There had to be physicality to die on the cross for us. Amen. Do you understand? He couldn't die as a spirit. What were they going to nail to the cross? A cloud? 
A pillar of fire? Imagine the Romans chasing that one. <laughs> he has to have physicality in order to pay the price that we needed him to pay for our sins. You might say, that's an unusual thought. Not really. It's not. Yeshua coming as an earthly infant through the power of the Holy Spirit was not the first time God had ever shown up in the physical form. There's a long history of this in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament. If we look at a few examples, we can understand that in the Garden of Eden, that God would show up in the cool of the day to talk and walk with Adam and Eve, and it says that they could hear him coming. How can you hear him coming if unless there's physicality? He's moving something, leaves, branches, twigs. Something's moving that they heard. And God would speak to them every day in the garden. He ate lunch with Abraham, didn't he? This is an important story where he comes with the two angels, and he tells Abraham the future, and Abraham says to Sarah, 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 quick, go make something to eat. Because he's here and he wants to eat. He's physical. He's hungry. Sarah runs off and, and makes some food. What did she make? Meat and milk. You see, that's a problem. Some of you that have been in Jerusalem with us for a while understand the dilemma now that we find ourselves. Wait, wait, did Yeshua eat it? It looked like he ate it. Now, we, we believe in keeping kosher for our Jewish members. I keep kosher at my house, of course, from a biblical perspective. The meat and the milk separation, we, we don't really necessarily see the clarity of that in the scriptures, but if that's what the Lord has laid on your heart, we bless you. All I'm saying is that when he ate lunch with Abraham, he had meat and milk. That's all I'm saying. I'm just, I'm just quoting the scripture. You know, a lot of people online just send in a lot of messages, by the way. That's just what happened. Guys in the control room are waving their arms like, Pastor Chad, don't say that. People are writing in right now. Don't say that. Do you know that God, in the physical form, wrestled with Jacob? They wrestled all night long, right? Hurt his hip, limp forever. Uh, that's what I think he looked like. He was limping, not from a ghost. Physicality. God has a physical form. He met with Joshua as the commander. He ate with the elders at Sinai. He was in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? He was physically there. They saw him. They could see his form. How do we know they could see his form? Because the outsiders looked in and said, look, there's a fourth person in there. We only put three. And then all of the stories that I've just recounted to you, they had eyewitnesses on the scene. You know what the eyewitnesses said when they saw this person, whoever it was, over and over? Every one of those eyewitnesses looked at that person and said, that's God. God has physicality. God can move in the physical realm. And it's important in the resurrection. There's a time where God introduced himself to the children of Israel for the first time collectively at Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 19. I want to read you a few verses. Look what happens when God shows up. It says, Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and the voice of God answered him. Remember what, what it says God's voice sounds like in the book of Revelation. It sounds like a, a trumpet. So the, the louder his voice got, the more the earth would shake. Physicality. God impacted. His presence coming impacted the physical world. That was the first time that the children of Israel had an encounter with God like that, where he showed up on the mountain in a, in a strong and mighty form. I bet it made an impression. I wonder what they took away from that. Okay, when God comes, the mountain shakes. Wouldn't that be a cool thing? Tonight, God is here, that when God comes, the house would shake. 
Would you be up for that tonight if that happened? Would you be excited to see the presence of God move in our midst? Or would you be afraid and you would say, oh, God, we don't, we don't want you to move like that. We want you to be a nice little clean, soft, gentle God. Stay over here in this box over here. And yet, the Bible is going to show us tonight in a pattern that if you want the real God, you better be ready for the earth to shake. The same story is recounted again later in Deuteronomy chapter 4. Listen to what it says, verse 15. You saw no form of any kind on the day the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the fire. Therefore, watch yourselves and be careful. He's speaking of the earth shaking, the earthquake happening, even though they didn't see him that day. He still impacted the physical world. The prophet Isaiah had a few things to say about the presence of God in chapter 29. He says, the Lord Almighty will come. There's the future tense. He will come with thunder and earthquake and great noise, with windstorm and tempest and flames of a devouring fire. The prophet is saying that when he comes, he will come with all of this stuff. The earth is going to shake. It's going to be noisy. Did you catch that? Yeah. Sometimes there's a generational divide. And sometimes we might say, hey, in my generation, when we worshiped, we worshiped a little differently. It was much quieter. Well, today we go a little louder. We, we get a little, little bit, we try to get a little bit more free. And we, we try to really pour ourselves out to God. You know, you know what I think worship really is? Worship is making your outside match your inside. Right? So if you're, you know, if you're a little bit excited about God, you're right here. You're hitting me with one of those. When you get excited about God, it starts to shake a little bit, doesn't it? Those knees start moving a little bit. Yeah, Pastor John, I know you had some moves. I got a few moves. <laughs> I don't know what y'all are doing back there. I don't, need, I don't see what y'all are doing behind me when I'm worshiping. I'm just worshiping. I'm doing little movements up here, and I'm dancing. I'm trying to pour my heart out to God. I can see the worship team laughing at me. You can see them sometimes. Why don't they smile and they giggle? It's because I did something weird down here. I do not care at all. My eyes are closed. My hands are up. Oh, my goodness, God. You're so amazing. I just want my outside to match my inside because it's like bursting out. Dance, sing, clap, shout, raise your hands, fall down. I do not care because I want your outside to match your inside. But we see a pattern in the scripture when God shows up. This idea for a second and third time of an earthquake when his presence comes. Isaiah predicted it. Do you know at Yeshua's death, there was an earthquake? Matthew chapter 27 reads this way. And when Yeshua had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Yeshua's resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. And when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Yeshua saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and they exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. When they saw the what? Earthquake. It was the earthquake that convinced the soldiers, oh my goodness, what did we do? That was the son of God. But I thought he didn't have physical form. I, I thought he was just a spirit. They didn't understand the theology of physicality, that God interacts with his physical world that he created. And it was at his death, there was an earthquake. And then again, at his resurrection, there was another earthquake is what it said. What's the deal with all the earthquakes, Pastor Chad? What's going on here? Does Jerusalem just sit on a fault line and we just have these earthquakes all the time? Friends, 
I want to take you back in history just for a moment to help you understand what's happening, what's going on. In the Garden of Eden, we had a choice. Notice I'm using the word we. We had a choice. We sinned. We chose. Some of you are thinking, I wasn't there. I didn't choose that. It's not a fruit that I like. You would have chose. At some point, we would have chosen. And we sinned. And we let sin come into the world. And we didn't just bring sin into our human bodies. We brought sin on the earth. And the earth started to feel the effects of sin. It wasn't just us, the creation in the human form. It wasn't just the animals. The earth itself began to be impacted by the sin. You don't remember the, one of the curses that God spoke over Adam and said, from now on you're going to have to work the ground? Meaning, before that you didn't have to work the ground. Food just starts popping up everywhere. I'm a little bit of a farmer. I wish that were true. The only thing that ever just pops up, tomatoes. I can do that with tomatoes. I've got that gift. Just starts popping up everywhere, my tomatoes. All the other stuff I'm trying to grow, it's hard work. Doesn't seem to work right. But the earth was affected by our sin, and the earth is excited for its own redemption. That's why when Yeshua shows up, the earth moves. It shakes. My creator's here. My creator's here. My creator's here. And it starts moving. And if the earth can react that way to the Messiah, why can't we? If the earth celebrates the return of the Messiah, why are we not celebrating the return of the Messiah this way? We see an earthquake took place at Yeshua's birth. Another earthquake took place at his resurrection. It shouldn't shock us because Isaiah told us exactly what was going to happen. When he comes, the earth will shake. That's one of the signs. That's how we know. None of these false prophets and false messiahs ever had the earth shake when they announced their coming. Schneerson never had that. He also never resurrected from the dead, did he? We thank you, Lord, for the signs you give us. Because earthquakes tend to play an important role as they indicate God's presence on earth. You see, the, the presence of God is affecting the physical realm. This theme of earthquakes is an important theme because it keeps showing up in these great moments in history. It even continues into the future. I've given you some past ones. How about a future one? Pastor Chad, is this a lesson on earthquakes? I didn't see that in the bulletin. Is that what we're doing today? Let me tell you a little bit about the future. Revelation chapter 11. Then God's temple in heaven was opened. Wouldn't you like to see that? God's temple open? I appreciate the one that was on earth. Can't wait to see the real one. And the doors are going to open. Listen to what it says. Then God's temple in heaven was opened. And within his temple was seen the Ark of the Covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and an earthquake and a severe hailstorm. The temple, the real one, the one Moses got to see before he made the example of the one on earth, the doors open and the earth shakes again. Why? Because it's announcing the king. There he is. You can see him. He's right there. The door opens. You get to see him. And the earth says, that's him. That's the one. That's the creator. We get to see him again. The earth is responding to its creator. This idea that when Yeshua makes something physical, that physical thing is connected to him. It listens to him. It does what he wants. But it wants to worship him. Do you understand? Why, why even in, in the other parts of the Bible, we get these, these strange analogies like the trees of the field will clap their hands. I mean, is that, really? Like, trees and they're clapping? What are they doing? How, are we supposed to take that literally? Because there's some sci-fi movies today that trees are real, right? They're walking, they're moving, tree people. I don't know, my kids watch this stuff. I don't know what it is. I see trees moving, talking, I don't know. But when Yeshua commands nature, it listens, right? It listens. 
Let there be light. Boom. I want some, I want some plants now. Boom. Looked at that water and he said, hey, guys, hey, water, listen up. I'm going to need to walk on you here in just a minute, okay? Y'all listen up. Here we go. Here I go. I'm stepping. Good. He's walking on the water. The water is listening to him. Shut up the sky. Nope, guys, not raining for a while, okay? Elijah will tell you when it's time. And he's just talking to the creation. He's telling it what to do. Fish, fish, listen. The disciples have had a really hard night. They... They haven't caught much. I'm going to need you guys to go on that side of the boat. <laughs> and listen, guys, little fishes, listen to me. Listen to me. This is your calling. This is your destiny. I need you to jump in Peter's net. <laughs> I know, I know. I know what you're thinking. But just jump into the net, okay? It listens to him. Hey, Mr. Whale, Mr. Whale, come on over. Come on over. I'm going to need you to go pick up Jonah. Here's the address. Go pick up Jonah. Take him here. Put it on the meter. If you need to put it on the meter. The earth responds to its creator because it wants to. A rock is not just a rock. A tree is not just a tree. It's a creation of the Almighty. And it wants to respond to him. Here's the challenge tonight, friends. How are we responding to him? There's more in us. You understand? There's more within us. And it's time to let that out to the Lord. Revelation chapter 16. I've given you a little bit of a lesson on earthquakes in the presence of the Lord. But there's a great earthquake coming. There's an earthquake that's the biggest earthquake of all of them. Are you ready for this? Revelation 16. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air. And out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, it is done. Then there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since mankind has been on the earth. So tremendous was the quake. Okay, just going back to the generation gap for a second. Notice every time God comes, it's loud. Okay? And then when he wants to talk, it's soft. His presence brings noise, but the intimacy is quiet. You understand? And then there's this biggest earthquake the earth has ever known. Because of the presence of the Lord, because of his voice is speaking. There's a, another one coming. Why does it quake this time? What is so important about this verse? Why is there, this the greatest earthquake of all time? Because the Messiah had stood up and said, it's done. I'm finished with my work, guys. I'm done. And the earth rejoiced. The earth itself physically rejoiced at the Messiah's work being done. You see, the earth has a heartbeat, and it's moving with the Messiah. The earth knows the timing of the Lord. Do we know the timing of the Lord? The earth tracks the seasons of God. Do we track the seasons of God? This is a holiday we should be really celebrating. I'm glad you're here tonight because you're faithful to what the Lord has called us to do. But are we tracking with God throughout the entire year? The earth certainly is doing this. You know, that's, that verse reminded me when it says that it is done and, and the earth began to shake. This wasn't the only time that that phrase had been used or something like it. John chapter 19, Yeshua was on the cross. And it says, when he had received the drink, Yeshua said, it is now finished. And with that, he bowed his head. He gave up his spirit. And then what happened? The earthquake that we read about in the first verse. At his death, there was an earthquake. He said, it is finished. There was an earthquake. Because the earth is responding to its creator. Now, how literally should we take this? Pastor Chad, this has been a fun time. I appreciate all the research you've done, all of this great lessons on earthquakeology, Seismatology. I heard somebody say that. But how literal are you trying to be? Well, going back to Isaiah chapter 2, it says this. People will flee to the caves and the rocks and to the holes in the ground from the fearful presence of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty when he rises to shake the earth. I hope you caught that. 
when he rises, that's a promise, when he rises, it will shake the earth. So when he is in the tomb, shouldn't we expect that when he rises, there should be an earthquake? Because the prophets predicted it. And the physicality of God is, is being woven into all of these stories. He's affecting the spirit and the physical realm. Now, we've proven that the earth was shaken at Yeshua's death and at his resurrection. But why? Why does it do it? Listen, I want to read you a passage from the book of Nahum. Now, this is not a book we get to quote very often. Not a lot of studies being done here. Not a lot of books written about this book of the Bible. But it's got a powerful verse about his presence. Nahum 1, verse 5. It says, The mountains quake before him, and the hills melt away. The earth trembles at his presence, the world and all who live in it. Did you see how it separated the world and all who live in it? It's not just us that are supposed to be bowing and worshiping and dancing and singing. It's the world itself that does these things. It responds. And Nahum gives us the answer because at his presence, the world rejoices and celebrates. That's a call to action. The earth is responding to its creator. I'm going to give you an opportunity in just a few minutes to respond to your creator. Prayer team, if you could just come on up quickly. Just post yourself quickly on this front row. Congregation, we're going to get a chance in just a few minutes to go back into worship with song. Our prayer team is up here to be with you, to encourage you, to pray for you. But I'm asking you to respond to the presence of your creator. Surely we can respond at least at the level of the earth itself. As a matter of fact, it's important to review that Yeshua, in fact, is the creator in case you've missed that tonight. John chapter 1, 1 through 3 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And He was in the beginning with God. And through Him all things were made, and without Him nothing was made that was made. So when we speak of Yeshua, yes, we are speaking about the Creator. He Himself is the Creator of all things. The book of Matthew reveals one more earthquake. There's one more. Matthew chapter 28, verse 1 and 2. It says, After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Miriam of Magdalena and the other Miriam went to look at the tomb of Yeshua. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord had come down from heaven, and going to the tomb, he rolled back the stone, and he sat on it. Let me just bring some clarity. Pastor Chad, you said earthquake at the death of Yeshua, earthquake at the resurrection of Yeshua. Isn't that the same thing? Nope. This is a third earthquake. Why? Because this one happened when the stone was rolled away, not just when he came back to life. Now why? Why would the earth tremble and move again because the stone was rolled away? Friend, get the picture in your mind. When the stone is rolled away, the Messiah in his physical form is being reintroduced to his world as the resurrected Messiah for the first time. The earth had never seen him as the resurrected one before. It was a new introduction. The earth got to rejoice again. Look at him now. We saw him before. We saw him when we were created. We saw him before he came down. We saw him when he came down. But look at him now. The stone was rolled away, and he reintroduced himself to the world, and the world rejoiced. The rocks began to shake. Mountains began to move, and they said, that's our God. That's our Messiah. There he is. And once again, the earth responded in worship. Three different earthquakes, death, resurrection, and the rolling of the stone. How do we respond tonight, friends? Let me read you one last verse before we close. Can you stand with me? I think you're going to need to stand for this verse. And the team is going to take us back into worship. 
The prayer partners are here. I want you to respond as the Lord leads you. But listen to this verse as we begin to worship the Lord. Acts chapter 2, verse 24. Are you ready? But God raised him from the dead, freeing Yeshua from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Hallelujah. Can you celebrate that tonight? Thank you.